Hey Braves, so we just finished up our astronomy unit and at the tail end there you started learning a little bit about Earth and all the different things that have to do with our orbit around the sun and our tilt and why we have seasons and all that stuff. Well now we're going to go on ahead and zoom in on the Earth a little bit more. We're going to focus instead on the history of the universe and how it works and instead we're going to start focusing on the history of Earth and how Earth works. How did all these mountains and valleys and volcanoes and all these layers of rock that your school is built on, how did it all come to be? Well, 4.5 billion years is a whole lot of time for us to cover, and we're not going to have time to do that. So hopefully we can kind of touch upon some of the more interesting and impactful events on Earth's history. And today's plan, the plan for this whole video, is to show you how we have figured some of these things out, some of the principles in geology that we use to reconstruct ancient environments and learn all the things about the history of the Earth that we've learned. And I will quickly go over some of the main events in Earth's history. Hopefully I'll keep this video from being too long, because there's been a lot of really cool things that have happened in Earth's past. Let's go on ahead and get into it. So, the principles of geology that are really useful to know, especially if you're just a, a brand new baby budding geologist, starts off with the Law of Uniformitarianism. The Law of Uniformitarianism, also known as the Uniformitarian Principle, is an assumption that the same natural laws and processes that operate in our planet today are the same natural laws and processes that operated on the planet 4 billion years ago. Basically, volcanoes erupted then the same way they erupted now. Rivers were eroding mountains 4 billion years ago, and they're eroding mountains today. So we take the patterns that are formed from, say, rivers, which erode mountains, and they take the sediment, and they drop that sediment into the ocean, right where the river meets an ocean or a seaway, they drop off all their sediment there. And that forms a very distinct pattern. And we can look at that pattern that's being formed today, and if we see that same pattern in the rock, well, we can assume there was a river there. So we're using things from today as a template to understand how things worked in the past. And the cool thing is, is there's all sorts of different processes that happened in the ancient environment that leave behind signatures or patterns for us to pick out. So the law of uniformitarianism is just all about that. Now, this can be taken too literally. And, and what I mean by that is that right now we're not experiencing any cataclysmic events. And you can use the idea of uniformitarianism to basically pretend that cataclysmic events don't happen. But we do have evidence of those cataclysmic events in Earth's rock layers in the history book of Earth. So we know that cataclysmic events happen, and therefore we don't take the law of uniformitarianism to its most extreme. So the law of original horizontality has to do with how sediment is first laid down. If you have a bottle of sand and water and you shake it up very vigorously and set it on a table, you will notice that it will all slowly percolate down to the bottom and settle in very nice, flat, horizontal layers. And the same is true if you go to a creek bed, or you go to the end of a river, or you go out into the ocean and you look how all those layers of sand are being slowly percolated down to the bottom of the ocean floor. Sediment lays down in nice, horizontal layers, and those horizontal layers continue out. And that's all the law of original horizontality is really about. Now this is important because when you go to a mountain chain or you go to a lot of rock outcrops, you will see the layers of earth might be bended. They might have a fault somewhere. There might be some way that these have been bended or tilted or whatever. So we use this idea that, hey, if we have rock layers that are angled like this, well, something must have been done to them to get them there because they were originally here. So it gives us a tool to start thinking about, well, how did those rock layers get at that funny angle? and it helps us unravel its history. What happened to those layers? So, pretty useful stuff. That gets me to the law of superposition, which we use in tandem with the law of original horizontality. Basically, the law of superposition says that the things on the bottom of a rock layer, or of a rock outcrop, are older than the stuff on top. That's really it. Be think of it this way. If you throw your friend in a hole and start trying to bury him up with sand, the sand that you put in first is going to be at the bottom of the hole, and the sand that you put at the very last is going to be at the top of the hole. The same thing is true for sediment. The stuff at the bottom is older than the stuff on the top. And we use that to determine the relative age of the rocks that we're looking at on different cliff faces or outcrops or what have you. 
The law of lateral continuity takes a minute to think about, <clears throat> but once you get it, it makes a whole lot of sense. Basically, because we know rock layers are laid down, and because there's been a whole lot of time for things to happen to those rock layers, sometimes you'll get rivers that will erode away a rock layer, and you'll have a valley. Now, if I were to look at the rock layers over here on this side, and find that it had a bunch of different fossils in it that were very particular, and maybe it's a red-colored layer of sandstone. Well, if I go across the valley over here to this side, and I see a red layer of sandstone with those similar fossils, I can assume they're the exact same layer, because we would assume that that layer of rock was continuous over the valley, and that the river eroded it away. So all it is is saying, draw like a little dotted line across valleys, and you should find the same layers of rock over there. That's the law of lateral continuity. Pretty straightforward. That gets us into the law of cross-cutting relationships. Now, cross-cutting relationships has to do with igneous intrusions. Igneous is another word for like molten rock. Igneous just indicates volcano, right? So molten rock, igneous, intrusion. That means something's coming in that's not supposed to come in. If I intrude on your privacy, I have now entered your room and I am all up in your privacy. So an igneous intrusion is when you have molten rock, like magma, working its way, pushing its way through the different sedimentary layers of rock that might have already been there. And basically, the thing that's cut through the dike, that's also another word for uh, igneous intrusion, the magma that cut through is younger than the rocks it cut through. That's pretty straightforward. That makes a lot of sense. I just said that, and you're like, well, yeah, duh, the rock layers had to be there first before it cut through. Exactly. So in the picture here on your screen, you'll see that on the left-hand side is a photograph of an actual rock outcrop. And you can see layers of limestone there stacked on each other straight up. And in, in the middle of them, going straight up through there, is a dike or an igneous intrusion. It's probably a piece of granite that, or sorry, it's probably molten granite that worked its way straight up through those rock layers, melted the surrounding area, and then it cooled, and now it's left behind granite rock. That granite rock is younger than the rocks that it cut through. That's the rule of cross-cutting relationships. Now, you can also use the same rule for fault lines. See, a fault is any time rock layers are broken and pushed up against each other. If you have a fault that cuts through the rock layers, that fault is younger than the rock layers. If that fault cuts through all the rock layers down here but stops, and then there's rock layers above the fault but they have not been cut, well, then the rock layers on top are the youngest thing, the fault is the next youngest thing, and then the rock layers that were faulted, like cut, well, those would be the oldest. So we use the law of cross-cutting relationships just to get another relative age of the things that we're looking at in a rock outcrop. And that gets me to what relative dating is all about. We don't always have radioactive isotopes in the rock that we're looking at. We don't always have a spectrometer when we're out in the field looking at a group of rocks. So what we end up doing is using all those principles I just told you to get an idea of how old everything is that we're looking at so we can start putting the story together. What happened first, right? You, in, in any story, you start off with an introduction and you have some sort of a problem that's set up and those characters work towards the climax and the climax happens and you get the whole point. Well, the same thing is true for what's happening on Earth. Things are happening in a sequence. It's a story. And in order to figure out the story, we have to figure out what happened first. And that's what relative dating is all about. Now, sometimes we use things like fossils that are really um, paired with a certain time period, and that will give us a better idea of what period we're looking at. Maybe it's a Pennsylvanian period. We only find this weird little shelled ancient creature in the Pennsylvanian period. And here it is in this rock. So this rock must be from the Pennsylvanian, and the stuff below it's older, and the stuff above it's younger. Relative dating. That's the best we can do. Now, if we're lucky, the rock layers we're looking at we can get a sample of, and if they have radioactive isotopes in them, we can use those radioactive isotopes to figure out how old that rock layer is almost exactly. Sometimes within 100,000 years, sometimes within 10,000 years. And if we're using carbon dating, within a couple hundred. Now, each radioactive isotope has its problems. Uranium is great if it breaks down into lead. The problem with uranium is it's fairly rare, so you're not going to find it very often. But uranium, because it's radioactive, let me pause. Radioactive just simply means that element doesn't want to stay that element very long. Uranium wants to turn into other things. It wants to break apart into other elements. So the parent material is the uranium. The daughter material is what it breaks up into. 
and it breaks up into that at a very particular rate. Think about like moving 50 miles an hour is a rate. Well, these things break up so many grams per year. So we can look at a radioactive isotope like uranium. It has a half-life of about a billion years. So in a billion years, I should have half of the amount of uranium I used to, and that should be replaced with lead. So if I know the ratio of lead to uranium, I can figure out exactly how long that has been inside of that rock. And that is how radiometric dating works. Now, again, depending on the type of thing we're using, for instance, radiocarbon. Carbon-14 is great if what I'm dating is younger than 70,000 years. After that, there's not enough radioactive carbon left because it's that half-life for us to be able to figure anything out. Basically, it completely disintegrates away and then it's no longer useful. But things like potassium argon, well, we can use that for things as old as a billion years. So each material, different uses for it. The problem with potassium argon is that argon's a gas. So if those rocks have been disturbed, we lose a lot of the argon and then our ratio is messed up and we don't get an exact age. So everything has its problems. Everything is good for different time ranges. And we just hope that we can find something in that rock to give us an exact age if we need it. Now, the last technique I'm going to talk about today, Now, there's some other things that we'll get into later, but the last thing that we use to try and get an idea of the ancient environments that we're putting together in geology is spectral analysis. Now, you've heard that word spectral before. If you recall, we use spectral analysis to figure out, A, how hot a star is, but what elements are in that star as well. So if you recall, elements, all of the different elements, hydrogen, oxygen, neon, they all put off different wavelengths of color when they're excited. And that's a really useful tool for figuring out what's in stars or what might be in the atmosphere of other planets. It's also really useful to figure out what's inside of the rock layers. Now, when I look at a piece of limestone, I know it's 99% calcium carbonate. And if I pour acid on it, it'll bubble and everything else. But there's a small percent of trace elements, less than 1%. That might give me clues as to what the ancient environment looked like, how much oxygen was in the atmosphere, what types of heavy metals might have been raining down from volcanic eruptions. Maybe, maybe there was an impact event from a meteor. Well, those all leave behind very specific chemical markers, and they tend to end up in the sediment, i.e. the stuff that becomes rocks. So if we pick up those little bits of different chemical markers or elemental markers, that's another piece of information we can use to figure out what the ancient environment was that we're trying to put back together. So how does it work? Well, we take a sample of rock, we shoot it with a laser, and the different colors that get shined off onto the image sensor are what the computer uses to figure out, hey, what's inside of this rock sample? It's pretty awesome. So we use those particular principles in geology to get an idea of what the ancient environment looked like, and that helps us piece together the history of Earth. Now, Unlike your textbook, which is, you know, page 1 to 5,535, and there's 535 million pages in, in order all the way to the end, in geology, we're missing a lot of chapters. We're missing a ton of pages in each chapter. So we have a rough idea of what happened, but to give you an idea, 99.9999999% of everything that has ever lived and died has left zero trace behind of itself. Most things are basically broken down and reused. So we don't get a lot of fossil evidence left behind. We have a very small fraction of the things that used to exist as fossils. So that's just with fossils and, and organisms. We have entire eons of rock layers missing here in Kansas because we didn't have a depositional environment. That's an environment that deposits sediment for us to get any pages of that book. So we have to go the entire globe and outcrops all over the place, mountains and everything else, and take maybe chapter six from over in England, and chapter 12 down in the Andes Mountains, and chapter five through seven in the Rockies, and we have to take it from all over the planet and try and put that together in a book to figure out the history of Earth. It's a complicated process, and not every geologist gets to see all the different pages. We all get to kind of work on a small fraction of the overall story before our careers are over and we get put in the ground and get recycled ourselves. So the point is, a lot of what we know about geology, we're lucky to have found. And we know quite a bit from what has been left behind, but we don't know everything. There's a lot of things that have existed that we'll never know existed. We'll never find evidence of. But with that in mind, 
let's go on ahead and talk about some of the things we do know that are kind of interesting about the history of Earth. 